evening's thinking. We're going to be asking, should we legalize drugs? Um, but of course, we sort of mean, should we legalize the drugs that are not already legal in the UK? Um, that would mean legalizing some of the other potent, psychoactive, and potentially extremely harmful substances um, in this country. Uh, but it would also mean bringing to an end decades and decades worth of criminalization of um, and punishment of people who use those drugs, um, people who are often in desperate need of support um, rather than punishment. So um, it's an it's extremely important question. I, I'm, I'm Luke Bedimer, I'm one of the, the reporters here at Tortoise. Um, and I'm gonna sort of refrain from giving a long preamble on this one because we're joined by uh, a group of people who have spent tremendous amount of time and attention and care looking at this subject um, and in doing so have built up a huge amount of experience. Um, I will say though, we're, we're obviously keen to hear from everybody here in the room. It is a tortoise thinking, if you have a view, which I, I hope everybody will, please just uh, raise your hand and catch my eye. If you're, if you're joining uh, remotely, um, do put your, your thoughts or comments in the chat. My colleague Phoebe is gonna be looking out for them. Um, and I think at, at some point I'll turn to her to give a bit of a sense of what the chat have been saying. Um, or just go ahead and raise your, your digital hand and I will keep an eye out for it. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to welcome Neil Woods, um, who's the author of Good Cop, Bad War, um, but also the chairman of Leap UK, uh, which is a, a network of law enforcement professionals who are f focused on changing what you see as uh, defunct, punitive drug law um, in the UK and around the world. Um, welcome also to Graham Johnson, who's an investiga investigative reporter um, and probably most relevantly to this, the author of Powder Wars and of Drug Lord, um, books that investigate quite sort of forensically the inner workings of some of the biggest criminal gangs in the UK. Um, joining us remotely, we have um, Naomi Burke Shine, who's the executive director of Harm Reduction International. Um, hi there, Naomi. We'll be able to see Naomi on the screen here. Um, and then <laughs> in addition, we have Ricky Gunawan, who's um, joining us. I'm not sure from where in the world, um, but he's a, a human rights lawyer um, and the program officer for drugs policy at the Open Society Foundations. And finally, uh, uh, we're very lucky on this, um, we're joined by Sir, Nor Sir Norman Lamb. Hi, Norman. I, I was told he would have his camera off, but it's brilliant you've got it on um, and uh, are here to join us. Um, Norman's only available for the first 15 minutes of this uh, thinking, so I thought it would make sense to, to start with him. But before we do that, I just wanted um, to quickly get a sense of like what the room thinks walking into this. So um, if I were to say legalize, keep the same, or something else. Can we have a show of hands? Who, who walked into this room thinking that legalization is a, is a good strategy for the UK? Interesting. Um, keep it the same. Anyone? And finally, something else, something, uh, an idea that you have in mind. Excellent, okay, well, you made that easy for me, Graham. Um, I would, yeah, as I said, I would love to start with Norman. Um, can you hear me, Norman? I can hear you. Yes. Um, so you you've. I'm um, hanging around on a street corner in Shoreditch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I won't ask you why. Um, <laughs> so you've um, you've put it to past governments, accused past governments, if I might, of failure on drugs policy, um, particularly failure to protect people, particularly failure to protect young people. Um, and I wondered if in this first sort of part of the conversation, I could get a sense of why you did that and um, what success would look like to you. What, what, what's the sort of shape of your alternative? Yeah, so, I mean, in my view, uh, the war on drugs has been a catastrophic failure. Uh, we've managed to uh, uh, enrich organized crime across the world to a staggering uh, degree. Uh, we've criminalized uh, particularly young people, 
uh, blighting their careers um, and uh, uh, turning them away from uh, employment and uh, and sort of success. Uh, and we fail to protect young people. And there is a race element to this because as one of your slides showed at the start, uh, you're more likely to be prosecuted if you're uh, black, uh, and yet uh, prevalence of use is no higher amongst black people than amongst white people. Uh, and it's poor uh, communities, often racialized communities, who bear the brunt of uh, the war on drugs. And the war on drugs in itself uh, leads to the use of extreme violence, because if you are wanting to protect your territory, uh, you can't go to the high court um, as you do in legitimate business. You uh, use extreme violence against your competitors. Uh, and the death toll has been uh, horrific, um, including, uh, you know, the, the violence within our own country is horrific. Um, and I suppose I come back to this point that we fail to protect young people. If you think about uh, cannabis in particular, um, I chair a mental health trust in London. I chair the South London and Maudsley. Um, persistent use of uh, potent strains of skunk available on the streets of London um, is associated, and I've talked to uh, experts about this a lot, is associated with a heightened risk of psychosis. Um, uh, and so the current approach is putting young people directly in harm's way. Uh, so it seems to be so much more sensible to regulate the market, uh, to control um, uh, both purity, uh, but also potency, to control the supply chain, uh, to regulate it. Um, and that, for me, is a rational approach and, which focuses on harm reduction. And Norman, does, does that process or that approach start with legalisation? Yes, it does. I mean, I would start, uh, I would do it on a sort of progressive basis. I'd start with cannabis. Um, uh, me, you know, Canada has legalized cannabis, many states in the United States, and not just the sort of uh, known liberal states uh, have already legalized. So we know what it's like. We know that the world doesn't cave in. So let's just get on and do that. Uh, let's decriminalize everything else so that you get the criminal justice system out of the way and you treat it as a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. And let's then set up a commission to uh, establish a rational framework, evidence-based framework for how we deal with all other drugs. Uh, but what we know is prohibition is a catastrophic failure. So let's move away from that. Interesting. So uh, just watching people's hands go up at the start and listening to you there, um, it feels like perhaps the kind of more useful project for this thinking and what we want to discuss is less like should we, shouldn't we, but perhaps what does it look like if we do? Um, Norman, whilst we've still got you, the, what, what, what have you seen as the obstacles to the approach that you've just described? So a progressive set of measures that begins with cannabis. I, in fact, I'd love to start with the question, why, why begin with cannabis? Well, because there's an established um, approach to cannabis in other countries, if you know this country is particularly cautious about its approach to drugs, catastrophically cautious incidentally, because the longer we delay, the more lives are harmed and damaged by uh, this approach. Um, it, it's, it's not a no risk option, just carrying on as we are. Um, but we know we, we, there's plenty of evidence of what a legal regulated market for cannabis looks like and there are different variations of that uh, depending on the sort of extent of the regulation so let's get on and do that uh, and then let's spend more time because uh, you know there isn't a record around the world of how best to regulate uh, the control of other drugs uh, let's spend some time working through how best that can be done but you ask you know um, what have been the impediments well, extreme cautious by, caution by uh, lawmakers. You know, uh, I was a member of parliament until 2019. Bizarrely, it used to be a coalition of Peter Lilly uh, on the right of the Conservative Party, uh, myself, 
and the only Green MP in Parliament who used to speak in favour of reform. Uh, I was a Liberal Democrat. Uh, now there are more, but both the main parties continue to resist the logic and the case for legalisation. Um, and they fear public opinion, even though we know that the polling shows that there is now majority support for legalising cannabis. Uh, but they also fear, of course, the Daily Mail and other newspapers that could cause trouble. But, you know, um, whilst they differ, um, lives are damaged. Um, you mentioned there the, the, the role of media. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you've seen, particularly in the time when you were active as an MP and, and taking part in that um, campaigning. What did you see from the media that you thought was um, an impediment to, to, more, uh, to, to, the, to the approach that you, you were describing? Well, um, there are parts of the media that are uh, hostile to reform and will uh, have a go at those members of parliament who uh, advocate for reform. But I have to say to you, you know, when I uh, came out and said that I supported legalisation, it was before the 2017 general election. I wasn't faced by a load of condemnation in the press. I stood for re-election in North Norfolk, which is hardly a sort of hotbed of radicalism. It's socially quite conservative. It, it's elderly. Uh, I didn't hide it. The Conservatives tried to make an issue of it. You know, in a particular hustings meeting, I ended up getting a big round of applause for making the case and, and pointing to the hypocrisy of so many politicians who, uh, you know, um, enjoy their drug of choice, alcohol, which is, after all, the most dangerous drug of all, as your slide shows. Um, uh, whilst uh, preventing others from benefiting uh, or from, from enjoying, and in some cases benefiting because of the health, health uh, benefits uh, of the use of cannabis for many conditions, um, preventing others from benefiting in that way. So there was enormous hypocrisy uh, as well as um, fear. But, you know, I got re-elected uh, advocating for this. So I think their fear is actually these days misplaced. That's what's so frustrating. Um, no, th there was one last question I wanted to, to put to you, which was, um, if you could present the best, most robust and reasoned argument against what you're saying, everything you've just described over the past few minutes, what would it be? I mean, that you could choose, like, if you were reflecting on what did people used to say to you, but did you see the, the other side, as it were? Well, the, the, the argument that you have to take seriously is, you know, if you legalise, let's just focus for a moment on cannabis, if you legalise cannabis, then it will lead to more use, it will lead to more use combined with tobacco, uh, there will therefore be more people experiencing harm uh, as a result. Uh, but as I say, um, I think we subject young people to particular harm by a completely uncontrolled market, uh, which is controlled by organized crime. And they tend not to have much interest in your welfare. So a young person buying a very potent strain, strain of skunk on the streets of Southeast London, where our trust is, they have no idea what they're buying. And the seller um, has no particular interest in keeping you safe. And in fact, if there's something that's going to uh, get you to come back for more regularly, then they will sell it to you. So, um, you know, let's just apply logic rather than an understandable fear. I think it's important for those of us who advocate reform to understand what the fears are and to try to address them rather than just dismissing people's anxieties. Mm. I, I mean, I can be very dismissive of leading politicians because of the total hypocrisy. Many of them, of course, have used drugs at university, including former prime ministers, cocaine and so forth, and then seek to criminalise fellow citizens for doing exactly what they did. But of course, they're privileged, so they don't run the risk of imprisonment and they can deploy expensive lawyers to keep them safe. That's the revolting hypocrisy. But, you know, ordinary people who just uh, have a concern about this, you should take their concerns seriously and make a reasoned, logical case for actually why 
my argument is based on harm reduction rather than putting people at greater risk. Um, I better go and uh, meet a mate for supper. <laughs> you do that, Norman. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, Naomi, there was actually there was a phrase um, that Norman used just there in that last sentence: um, harm reduction. That is the the core focus of the work that you do, um, and the coalitions that you've built. Um, and I wondered if you could just for our benefit set out what you think the kind of key characteristics of harm reduction when it comes to drug policy are. Yeah, thanks. Um, Norman did a fantastic job paving the way for this very complex and nuanced discussion that we're uh, having this evening. So I work at Harm Reduction International um, and harm reduction is about the policies, the programs, the practices that aim to reduce the harms associated with both drug use and drug policy. The thing about harm reduction is it's, it's very pragmatic. It comes at the, the situation of drug use by saying, we want to understand what, where you're at right now and how we can help. So harm reduction doesn't say you need to stop using drugs and adhere to a certain set of rules before you can walk in the door and you know be welcomed by our services. It's based on a very kind of compassionate, pragmatic approach to like meeting people and seeing how we can keep them safe and healthy. Um, it's evidence-based. There's been decades of support showing that if you meet people and ask them what their needs are, you can put them in touch with the right social services, the right health services, and get better results, keep people healthy and safe. Um, and so this whole kind of this whole kind of approach is very much grounded in justice and human dignity, um, and, and respecting people, um, knowing that people make a range of different choices in their life, um, and th and that they need to kind of grow and live through them, and we need to be there to support them through that. Yeah. And how and I guess where in the world have you seen sort of the most compelling evidence for the effectiveness of that approach, like across across where you've um, you've been working and observing? Yeah, well, harm reduction is, is um, has pretty solid uptake. Um, there's about 179 countries that report injecting drug use to the UN every year, um, and about half of those have harm reduction measures in place. Um, that means providing sterile needles and syringes to people who may inject drugs, offering um, counselling and support, drug checking if you want to understand what's in the substance that you're about to consume or you're considering consuming, overdose prevention sites where you can have a medical support, a medic support you or supervise your injecting, and then also providing naloxone, which is the medication that reverses an opiate, an opiate overdose. So, so all, all these services are available pretty widely around the world. They're not available as much as we would like them, um, but there are many, many governments who have these services in place and are really taking the needs of their community seriously. So, so harm reduction measures are something that can exist anywhere, pretty much, even in the presence of quite, um, pu quite punitive drug laws, drug laws that will very aggressively criminalise, imprison, etc., people who who are using drugs. Yeah, harm, redu harm reduction is consistent with the criminalisation framework and really kind of works to mitigate the, the, the impact, the negative impact of that criminalization framework and the prohibition framework under which we exist. So what, um, and it, what, it, sorry, sorry, Naomi, what, what's your, what is your perspective then? You say that they, they can coexist. Do they antagonize one another at all? Like what's your perspective on the, the question at hand and whether, whether in the context of legalization, harm reduction works better or worse or stays the same? Yeah, well, <laughs> so they can coexist, but there's no doubt that we're up against quite an oppressive and overwhelming system. You know, the, the prohibition paradigm, the International Drug Control Conventions, there are hundreds of billions of dollars poured into drug law enforcement all around the world every year. And the UK is no exception to that. Um, harm reduction kind of exists and struggles in that frame to keep people safe and healthy. Uh, but would thrive and, and, and do better under a post-prohibition environment. And a little bit like Norman said, when we talk about legalization, we're really talking about a, a combination of procedures and practices we put in place to regulate the drugs that are available um, and to address the mass incarceration that's been you know, the result of the war on drugs and to address the use of the death penalty for drugs, to address all the human rights violations, the racist policing, the things that go wrong under our current paradigm. Um, please uh, say again, just raise your hand if you've got uh, comments or reflections or anything. But I'd love to turn just on that last point to Ricky, um, if you're there, because I, I, I was reading some of the, the content 
and ideas and things that you've been posting over the past days and weeks on the use of the death penalty as this kind of this extreme in the outcomes from the policing of drugs. Ricky, I really, the question I had for you is like, what are you, what are you seeing? What's going on? What, what, are, what are your reflections on this question and, and anything else that's been said? Yes, thanks um, <clears throat> for the questions. Well, I, I would start with by saying that illicit drugs or yeah, illicit drugs are a powerful imaginary for authoritarian and repressive practices. It's deployed to uh, protect a population from quote unquote a foreign trade. And this is a phenomenon that we see in most um, Asian countries and labeled as an aid to crime and terror and used as justification to surveil, to police and to purge an undesirable segment of the society. And that is drug traffickers or drug users. And today we see like in many countries in Asia that retain the death penalty for drugs, poor people and African nationals are overrepresented among the death row populations. And across the world, incarcerations of women is increasing um, at an alarming rate, um, whereas the male incarceration rate increased not so much if compared to the women. And, uh, result of uh, drug related offenses. Exactly, exactly. Right. And in many uh, countries that retain the death penalty, women are also uh, overrepresented in the populations. And these are women who are manipulated by the traffickers or exploited by their partners. And these are women who, some of them, they genuinely don't know that they carry drugs from one place to another. And then at the end, they are arrested and sentenced to death without any adequate legal defense. And this happens again across many countries that retain the death penalty. Mm. Um, so we, we were talking obviously about the, the harm reduction approach, but also about the sort of power that is lent to organized crime if you continue to aggressively police the trafficking, sale and possession of drugs. Um, I guess there's a, there's a question here, which is, where have you seen success? Where have you seen what, to you, looked like progress, whether that's in, in Indonesia or, or elsewhere? Um, well, it depends, right? In America or European countries, where some countries already decriminalized, that's quite a progress. And some countries willing to go for further like legalizing. Like for example, Germany, where I'm based in Berlin, the, the government is preparing uh, regulation cannabis. But in Asian countries where decriminalization is very far, so a progress is, for example, where politicians are willing to openly discuss, for example, medical cannabis or decriminalizing drugs because five out of like 10 top uh, countries in the world with um, overcrowding prison populations are in Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asian leaders are still reluctant to discuss openly about decriminalizing drugs as a way to reduce overcrowding. So for me, a progress is, of course, if the leaders are willing to openly discuss and honestly discuss policies that would work and not just would work, but also admit that it's not working, the punitive policies that are in place, and then evaluate the policies and develop some kind of policies that are evidence-based and it's um, promoting health rather than um, repressive approaches. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Ricky. Um, that's the subject I would love to turn to you on, Neil, because the work that Leap does, at least in part, is about trying to bring the voice of policing professionals into the same conversation that leaders are having, as Ricky's mentioned, and trying to shape opinion that way. Uh, I guess I've got two questions. The first is, how's it going? Um, and the second is, the, the ordinary people that were mentioned earlier, where are their voices in that conversation, do you think? <laughs> 
Oh, well, that's a big question. As, as for how it's going, I'm, I'd have to give you a little bit of context, if, if I may, because um, quite often I get asked, well, wh why, you know, if this argument is so logical, why aren't they, all of the public already behind it? And, and the reason for that is that police all across the world lie to the public. Because every single day the police are putting out images of the biggest drug seizure they've ever had, the biggest drug gang they've ever captured, some kingpin has been arrested. And the public are reassured that look at, look at what the police are doing. The current system must work because look at that massive pile of drugs. So this is happening all the time, but it's dishonest. Because within the fabric of policing, we know, really, our criminal intelligence databases tell us that when we make a big arrest, Violence goes up because people fight for that opportunity in the marketplace. We know that it's increasing corruption. So if the police were honest about what they know with the public, we would get change much quicker. So that is part of the mission of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership around the world, is to challenge that police narrative. And all, all we want is honesty and to follow evidence. Uh, so how that's going? Well, it, in the UK, we've had huge influence. We, we now have a peculiar and really good situation in the UK where actually police leaders are leading the debate on drug law reform. They're a way ahead of politics. You've got police leaders having diversion schemes, which is essentially a de facto decriminalisation. You've got police leaders paying for heroin-assisted treatment, which is essentially the legal regulation of heroin. W would you mind just explaining what, those, what a diversion scheme is? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, a diversion scheme means that when a constable comes across somebody with some drugs, they have the option to or rather that their first response should be to direct that person to, to get into treatment services to right. see if they need help rather than arrest them. And they're doing this very successfully in the Thames Valley and various other places like County Durham. Th this is essentially the police taking, getting a hold of this policy themselves and decriminalising those people, avoiding them having the harms of the criminal justice system. But that's ahead of politics. Mm -hmm. And heroin-assisted treatment is where... Uh, problematic heroin consumers are given the heroin, clean, medical-grade heroin, to keep them alive and safe and to rescue them from the exploitation of organised crime. And that's policing money that's paying for that up in Middlesbrough, for example. This is the way of the future. And what is it, I, I don't know, is it a strategic question, a funding question, a policy question, or just a matter of time before that, those, those practices kind of proliferate that where, where it's the norm around the country, do you think? Well, hopefully, hopefully yeah. it's a matter of time, but bear in mind that this, um, the prescribing of heroin to problematic heroin consumers, for example, is what we used to do in this country. It's what we used to call the British system, which ended in the 1960s. And they've been doing that in Switzerland on, on a national scale since 1994. And in Switzerland, they use British evidence to inform that policy. So you can, it shows how far we are behind more progressive thinking in, in other countries. But you know, it's part of our job at Leap UK and uh, with our allies to, to move that conversation along. And we are doing well in, in persuading police, not just in the UK, but across the world. But your second question about where are people's voices? Well, people who use drugs are not, their voices aren't in the, in the mix often enough. There are organisations of people who use drugs and they should be up front and centre in this, in this conversation. But it's also worth pointing out that we talk a lot in debates like this about problematic use people who need help, medical help. 90% of drug use is non-problematic. Right. And it's important well, to say that. What does that, that. mean? So what, what's the definition, as it were, of well, non-problematic? Non-problematic is as in people who use drugs like cocaine or amphetamine, right. they have no problematic relationship with that drug. They don't have an addiction problem. It doesn't impact on their life. Right. They are merely making the choice to use that when it suits them and it's not causing them a problem. It's very important to make that point because we get less lost in this idea that all drug use is a problem, and it's not. Because by, 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 by not realising that, we're not adequately focusing on what causes problematic use. Right. And actually, criminalising people helps cause that problematic yeah. use. It's a root problem of prohibition. So, you've, you've no shortage of experience of people in that cycle of, of problematic use. Could you just explain what it was you did sort of throughout, throughout your, your career um, and the factors that you saw contributing to that problematic use versus the 90% the that, that is non-problematic? Yeah, well, I'm, as an undercover police officer, I used, I used to 
infiltrate drug dealing gangs. In order to do that, I would manipulate very vulnerable people. Mm. So I would look for the most vulnerable people, actually, the people who were using the most heroin and the most crack cocaine, because they were the easiest to manipulate, and I could make them do what I wanted to. I knew I was causing harm to those people. I knew. I knew I was causing them emotional harm. I knew I was bringing them into the criminal justice system and putting them through the meat grinder. But I didn't really care because, to me, the end justified the means to catch the gangster at the end of the operation. And it was a rude awakening, a harmful awakening for me personally to realise that, no, that, what, that harm was not justified. Mm. None of the harm that's ever caused to any drug consumer is justified. Yeah, OK, I caught lots of gangsters, lots of them. But there's always more, and they're perpetually getting more violent, to learn from the mistakes of those ones who got caught. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's a subject it would be good to turn to you on, the sort of increasing violence, the, the function of organised crime around drugs. Um, could you tell us a bit, I guess, first of all, tell us a bit about what you actually did, what you observed in, your, in, in the, the books that you wrote, and perhaps how that changed your perspective on the way that drugs work in the UK, as well as being the, sort of the only person that put their hand up when we were asked, sort of, what's something else? If you could tell us what that something else is as well, Graham, that would be well, great. The problem is I don't know what the something else is. Right. Uh, even after 20-odd years of... of, of of writing about that world and being in uh, being in that world, yeah. and I I like uh, Neil. It's Neil. Started off as a as an undercover journalist, you know, uh, buying drugs off uh, low level drug dealers uh, for a newspaper for a couple of newspapers, and then eventually started writing about the high level drug dealers, the uh, the, the, the the top tier, and but. Uh, and it was so complex, it was really, really complex of, of how, especially when I, when I started off in Liverpool doing it, of how like drugs just took over the city in the 80s. And I've remained in charge since, you know, t blew out the economy, uh, blew out the political system, and I've become part of, of mainstream living in, in that city for large swathes of it. And I see the same thing in South East London. Um, uh, it, what it, all I could figure out is that what happens is that if you increase the amount of drugs in, in, a, in a community, uh, the, the amount of reason in the community decreases. Mm. And reason is like the common good, you know, the ability to think, the ability to get through the day, to get organised, to be resourceful and flourish. And drugs, uh, drugs, it, it, it increases the, the vices, you know, it increases the lust for pleasure, it increases greed, you know, it, it increases injustice, mm. all these basic things. It leads to all, all those increases of passions like anger, which leads to violence and, and, and all the rest of it. And we see, see it all day long in, uh, in, in like a, a, a big city big city like London. So what I think is that if you, if you legalise drugs, the amount of drugs supply will increase and therefore the amount of reason mm. will decrease and that leads to chaos in communities, particularly poor communities. And, and what would you say then, though, to the argument um, that Neil's made and also that yeah. came up earlier about organised crime yeah. and the way that drugs and the sale of drugs essentially furnishes criminals with power... Oh, in the case right. of legal, yeah. right? That's right. I mean, massive disproportion of power, you know, and you, you, you know, and and I've watched it go from from economic power in the eighties and nineties to political power now, mm. you know, where 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 Liverpool has turned into a kind of medieval fiefdom, where it's you know it was run from behind the scenes by five or six drug dealers who controlled. Uh, parts of the the council there, and part of the infrastructure in other, in other parts of the city, and controlled the property market, and control and effectively controlled the economy. In, in my view, I mean, mm. I first saw this when when I was a sixth former. I worked in a in a, in a bookies of Saturday, uh, it's a, and and what I noticed was suddenly lads would turn up with uh, with thirty grand. This was in 1985, 86. 
30 grand in, in, in a plastic bag in the, in the track sheet shop or whatever. 500 pound on trap one, 500 pound on trap two. All day long, all day long, all day long. And that was at the beginning of it. So you can imagine what's happened 40 years later, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years later, when these, the, these same drug dealers, these same drug dealers who, who I saw then, uh, control tens of millions of pounds worth of property and businesses, not only in, not only in Liverpool, but you know, all, over, all over Europe and far beyond, yeah. as, uh, as you will know, you know. And so it's a hugely complex problem and I don't think legalising it will, will solve this problem. Right. Interesting. I think that's a good point. I'd love to hear from a couple of people and also from uh, Phoebe just to give us a sense of what people in the chat are saying. That would be great. Um, yeah, so, um, and just to add, I think it's like nice, we've got a kind of a range of, of views on, on what legalisation looks like, which is kind of how the chat is going. I think there's a few discussions of money and kind of following the money and, and how important that is. I think it's really interesting, and I think we spoke about this, Luke, a little bit, is about the difference between US prisons and UK prisons and where UK prisons are going in terms of incarceration, just kind of looking at the statistics on that and, and really digging into those. It's quite easy just to think about the US figures, but I think more time, for example, I was surprised to see that Chinese and Asian groups are kind of disproportionately affected in some areas, so it'd be good to get into that. Um, and I think there was some, you know, Char the, Charlotte's been very, very active in the chat and asking some good questions, but um, I think uh, Gray Andrews said, decriminalize, educate, regulate, treat addiction as having a prior cause and attend to that, not merely treating it as an illness. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the thing here is that there's the politics, there's the money, um, but also the health. And, and one of the slides that really stuck with me doing the research was the difference between how people thought the NHS should deal with this problem and how people thought the legal yeah. and criminal system should deal with this yeah. problem and how we treat addiction, which um, if you've come to previous thinkings about uh, other things to do with addiction that I'm interested in, then yeah, that's, that's yeah. another area to kind of pick into at the same time. Yeah. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, do you want to get, we pass the mic over there, that'd be brilliant. Um, just on your point about um, drugs and how that sort of affects society, like the impact of drugs affects communities, especially poorer communities. I guess my question would be, is that not also true of alcohol? And doesn't that say something about the fact that, we, I mean, Luke and I were talking about this earlier, our society should maybe be putting more money investing in treatment of, of those addictions and, and not always addictions, but even just use and, and what that does to, to a society rather than the criminalization element. Um, I just wanted to yeah, I think, uh, listen, I think it's a good point about alcohol because, you know, uh, alcohol is our national sport, isn't it, you know, and, you know, but I, it's, I mean, I don't think there's any point in, you know, you, you've got a big alcohol problem or you've got lots of people who, who use alcohol and then, you know, throwing even more cocaine or more heroin or more ketamine or whatever it is into the mix. I don't, I don't think uh, that's going to help. And, and uh, I, I mean, I, I hear some really interesting conversations now about, about drugs. So I heard one the other day, and I heard one the other day. So this is a, a millionaire businessman type who's got, who's got political ambitions. And his take on it was, uh, I'm really glad, I'm really, really glad that we've got a cocaine problem, you know, uh, you know, and that cocaine is thirty pound a gram, and lots of people go out and use it regularly uh, at the weekend, because he said that's replaced the heroin problem, uh, in his view, in the long term, and heroin is much more harmful, in his view, than than uh, that, than cocaine, because it it, it 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 harms people quicker than cocaine, and also. And then someone else said, well, yeah, and also cocaine helps the nighttime economy. Uh, it, it, that, was, that, was a, that was a byproduct of having cocaine because people go out and they spend more. And this was, these were like serious people having a serious chat about it uh, because that's how complex mm. and how deep uh, the, the drug thing is becoming in, this, in, our, in our society. You know, it's not just about legalising it or, 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 you know, yeah, there are layers of, layers of uh, yeah, yeah, and la layers of nuance. Yeah. 
which I, I, I didn't realise. Yeah, I, I wondered, Neil, that you made a point to me just a moment ago about all, lots of these measures, they don't shrink the size of the actual market, whether it's policing, whatever. What, what did you sort of mean by that in the round? And how does that kind of, what bearing does it have on this idea that, you know, whether it's alcohol, whether it's heroin, whether it's cocaine, like people seek out and use these substances? Trying to deal with this by policing mm. just sharpens the sword of organised crime. It creates a Darwinian situation where drugs policing thins out the competition. What you're left with is the most ruthless and violent gangsters. That's what drug prohibition does. Because police never shrink the size of the market. No matter how big the seizure, the market is not reduced. So we're not doing any good with what we're, what we're trying to do. That's an important point because... the, the People are lulled into this idea that there is some benefit from drugs policing, that there is some, some drugs prevented from reaching the streets. Anyone who wants their drug of choice can go and get it. There is nothing to suggest that drug consumption will go up through legal regulation. Mm. But the numbers of people using drugs are not the issue. The numbers of people using drugs problematically are the issue. And problematic use is more likely in a, pre, in a punitive situation. There's lots of evidence of that. Mm. And we need to be considering the numbers of people using problematically as the metric to work on, not the numbers of people using drugs, because 90% of people who use drugs do so non-problematically. And as people have said, you know, alcohol is, is actually, scientifically, the worst of those drugs. Uh, we, we don't regulate it well enough. We could mm. do better. But certainly we can regulate, we, we can, by taking control away from organised crime, and regulating these products, we will have much better outcomes. And one of the most interesting and important measurements that we can look at from North America is that actually underage access to cannabis has gone down. There are less children using cannabis where it's regulated because you can take, you can have better control. And drug dealers don't use photo ID to check yeah. your age. Yeah. So interesting. Um, could we uh, just pass the microphone back that way to first over here and then? Gentlemen at the back. No, please go. Go ahead. Um, so I, I've kind of got two points. One is what you were just saying, where in uh, the Netherlands, when they illegalised cannabis, they didn't see an increase. They actually saw a decrease in use in local in local communities, mm. and the, the increase came from um, tourist tourism. So I'm not sure if we legalise that that would guarantee that like everyone would just be like, oh well, it's legal, so I'm just going to take cocaine now. <laughs> like, mm. If you know, as you said, you can get it. Um, but I guess my question is, there are lots of gangs at the moment who control the drug rings. There's a lot of money involved. If we just legalise it, what's going to happen to them? Like, because they're not just going to let that money go. So what does that mean? I love and that question. Great question. Yeah. Do you have a view, Neil? I'd love to know also um, whether Naomi and, and Ricky have a point, but please. Yeah, I mean... the. the <laughs> It, this is this is at the core of the greatest misunderstanding of the nature of organised crime. Crime is not caused by criminals. It's caused by opportunity. And the greatest opportunity for crime that's ever been created is the prohibition of drugs. As Ian Fleming predicted, it's the mother of crime. And other crime exists because of this power. And the National Crime Agency say in their strategic assessments into organised crime, they make the point that there's this vast wealth from the illicit drug markets is reinvested into other forms of criminality. It's what makes other crime possible. Everyone knows you want to start up a business, you need investment. Well, the illicit drugs economy is the investment bank for every other kind of crime. It's what makes it possible. So if you want to tackle every activity of organised crime, all of this interconnected thing that they do, the starting point is taking their power away, to take the market away from them. Mm. And so the means, that kind of as we've discussed, the means of doing that are not only change the laws surrounding possession of the drug, but also, as Naomi and Ricky were talking about, actually help the people who are demanding the drugs in the first place and keep them out of that sort of problematic use phase. Um, I just wanted to put the question maybe to you, Naomi. Um, in, in your experience and the, the people that you've worked with, does the the harm reduction measures do sorry do the harm reduction measures you've described 
lead in the end to an overall reduction in use or is it just a reduction in harm that they, they typically achieve? I, th I think looking for an indicator around reduction in use might be a bit reductive, uh, forgive the repetition. You know, pe people, as a rule, people do tend to age out of drug use. Um, and again, if we could return to Neil's point, the vast majority of people who use drugs do so non-problematically and without any kind of implications for their life, their ability to hold down a job, to be part of a family. And I think, I think it kind of goes back to that point of like, it's not actually ever about the drugs. Where, where we see uh, complex social issues, it's about you know, the cost of living crisis in the UK, it's about poverty, it's about intersectional vulnerability, it's about communities where people can't get a job. Um, and so, you know, while Graham paints a picture of societies barreling towards chaos in the event of some sort of regulated or, or legalized market, you know, Portugal decriminalized all drugs 20 years ago, and decriminalized is different to legalized, but, but they found no increase in overall drug use over the years and great health outcomes in terms of reduction of overdose deaths, reduction of HIV and hepatitis C transmission. I think another really interesting jurisdiction to keep an eye on is Oregon. Last year, Oregon decriminalized and regulated and legalized almost all drugs. So like cocaine, heroin, cannabis, MDMA, the whole lot. And so what they're doing, which is really interesting as well, is they're using the tax revenue generated from the sale of these drugs on the regulated market to put back into health and social programs. And it's, it's a really, really complex thing, you know, like your audience member was talking about, we're talking about taking power away from complex illicit market systems, but it's a process that we need to start and we need to start sooner rather than later because the war on drugs is having a pretty devastating impact. Um, so yeah, just to flag that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Can we get the microphone back there? It'd be great to hear from you. Um, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have much of a point anymore, actually. Um, well, but, say um, something. But no, the, the, <laughs> the, the question was that, um, well, firstly, I just wanted to put in a good word for drugs. I think they're awesome. Um, and I think, and, you know, and the fact that we're, a lot of the framing comes from the idea that it's harm reduction and so on. I know we're talking about it being positive as well, but like they are, I would argue that they are a positive good for society if used well. Mm. You know, I, I don't think, I'm not suggesting that everybody should take them, but I think actually, I think it helps a lot of people be creative, uh, keep a degree of sanity in a rather insane world and, uh, and bond more effectively with other people. Um, but the core question was, is there a, if you legalize selectively, if you legalize say MDMA and marijuana, does that reduce the consumption of heroin, cocaine, and the other, you know, ketamine and the other more sort of, you know, I'm not sure ketamine is addictive, but the, the addictive and harmful ones. Mm. It's just, well, of course, we're not advocating anybody go and try any illegal drugs, of course, but it's an interesting point. No, no, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point you make that they actually, for a long time, almost the entirety of human history have served a purpose in that they've been part of how we engage with culture and, and with one another. So it certainly is interesting. But to, to that second point, how, how mindful do we need to be of, I guess it's that chart that appeared, right? This, this kind of um, graded level of harm that you get. And your point, Graham, there are some drugs, I think we'd all agree that would affect that reason that you were talking about more so than others, right? In smaller quantities, they will have a larger effect. W what's, your, what's your view on that, Neil? Like, is, is there something in the, um, the class system that we currently have, it's just the buckets have the wrong drugs in them? Oh, the, the misuse of drugs acts is nonsense. Yeah. The, 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 the relative harms and the way that it's regular, that, that they fit into that act, it makes no sense at all, no, none at all. You, you have psilocybin in the same uh, medical category as, as, as um, well, high, higher than heroin, mm. because it, it just declared to have no medical use, but of course with lots of studies suggest that it clearly does have at the moment. But that, that chart is a, is a good starting point because it makes the point that drugs should be regulated according to their relative risks. Some yeah. drugs will need much more strict regulation and control and others will need less so. But MDMA is a good example to mention because it's the, it's the perfect example of a drug which is not banned because it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it's banned. Mm -hmm. Because of all of the deaths and all of the problems that you see with MDMA is because it's an unregulated product. Either it's a product which doesn't contain MDMA or it's a pill which is four times too strong. There is very little risk 
for if it was a properly regulated product in a measured dose in a blister pack, which you could perhaps buy from a, a registered pharmacy. Yeah. So that chart and following the evidence, following the science, is, a, is an incredibly important thing to do, and it's, it's incredibly lacking in, in the political, wider political data about yeah. what, d debate about what we should do about drugs. Um, it's so interesting. So I would like to get to the kind of question just in this last bit of what's standing in the way of the change, some of the changes that we've sort of started to outline and some of the things that seem extremely sort of reasonable when you look at some of the evidence we've proposed, what Naomi and yourself have said. Um, but just starting with you briefly, Graham, shaping people's opinions about drugs and drug culture is something that you've actually, you've had a pretty active hand in, right? You've told some very compelling stories about how drugs and people interact in this country. Um, when you were doing that, what, what made you think, wh why did you start? What, why did you choose to write about those things in the way, in the way that you did? Well, I, th I think there's, there's two answers to that question. So when I work for tabloid newspapers, uh, my job was to scare the public uh, about drugs. So I worked for the Sunday Mirror and News of the World and, and for, the, for the Mail as a, as a freelancer. And so that was a very reactionary uh, form, of, form of journalism. And it was, it was yeah, it was, it was fake news and it was peddling the lie that your, you know, your profession was putting out there because it was always on the side of the police and it was always saying drug dealers are really bad and uh, uh, drug dealers should be locked up for a long time. So yeah, I did that for a long time. Uh, but the, but, the, but the, more, the much more interesting story, when I had a bit more freedom later and, and, and I started writing books, was about, you know, about organised crime and the, the, effect, the effect that had. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, but the, but the bottom line is, is the reactionary, the reactionary uh, model is, the, is, the st is still the dominant one. Right. So, you, you, you know, you could be cancelled by the... I've, I mean, I've seen people in your profession uh, I remember there was a guy who worked for the United Nations years ago who came out and he said some very mild things about legalising drugs and he lost his job, you know, because uh, the Daily Mail got on his case. So, it, 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 you know, you, you do play a dangerous game uh, if you play it with uh, Britain's powerful tabloid newspapers. Uh, so despite all the things that Norman described at the beginning, we're still in a transition, or hopefully in a transitionary period where the types of stories that, about drugs that people respond to and care about, particularly when it comes, I guess, to the truth about harms, that's that's yet to come. Um, the the little flag has gone up for the end of end of the the thinking, but I'd love to just do a quick uh, whip round at the end of this, which is not so much to ask should we legalise drugs, but to ask you, Neil, um, and then hopefully Naomi and Ricky. What's the sort of most important thing you'd like to see taking place in the short term to achieve what I think we've all kind of agreed here would be the, the most humane outcome around legalization? What's, I guess that's another way of asking, like, what is LEAP's top priority at the moment? Well, I mean, we, we advocate full fat regulation, full fat reform, full legal regulation, because right. that's the best way to take the power away from organized crime but it must be done with social equity in mind. Because if big business take over at any part of this market, then the people who are marginalised by the current system could be even more so, uh, or some of them even more so, by, by, a, by big business. And so we have to invest in the communities which are most oppressed. We have to uh, create opportunities uh, for those people who are suffering now rather than further marginalise them. I mean, consider South Africa, for example, Drug, the drug laws in South Africa have kept apartheid going. Right. Apartheid still exists because the black majority are oppressed by the drug laws that the white minority are not oppressed by. Mm. Imagine big business taking over there where some of the townships like the Cape Flats near Cape Town, their economy, people, poor people survive because of the illicit drug economy. Mm. Imagine big business taking over there without consideration of their welfare. What, what drugs yeah. do they sell in, in South Africa? Well, I mean... Cannabis has now it's been decriminalised. The use, use and consumption of cannabis has, has been decriminalised there. But they have a huge amount of methamphetamine consumption yeah. there. Um, and particularly methamphetamine and cannabis. Yeah. But, but 
you know, there'll be a range of drugs. You know, people, there are poor drugs. people suffering there who are using drugs for comfort, and they are and they're feeding their children by selling it. If you know, if if you regulate, if you legally regulate there, without careful consideration <coughs> of the impacts, you could be causing secondary yeah. harm. You swap one form of exploitation and oppression for another. Exactly. Um, Naomi, please, I'd love to put a similar question to you, I guess, which is. In your in your work, are those what Neil's just outlined some of the the kind of key concerns for you also? Yeah, absolutely. I think I was going to kind of try to boil it down. You know, we spend seven hundred and fifty times more on punitive responses to drugs than we do on health and social services. If we could just you know demand of our politicians accountable use of taxpayer money funding, putting money into communities that are heavily policed, addressing the harms to the black, brown and indigenous communities around the world um, and asking drug users what their needs are. I think we do a lot better and our, our, our money would have a, a much more positive impact on society. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ricky, I'll, I'll give, you, give you the last word. Yes, um, I, I would say legalizations in this sense, I would interpret as equitably and responsibly regulate um, and diminish the negative consequences of prohibitions and support the health, safety and, and social inclusions of, mm. of drug involved populations. So the state money that have been used to criminalize and incarcerate a majority of marginalized people should be shifted to towards the health educations and build social support for those disproportionately uh, affected by the drug wars. Yeah. So interesting. Right. Thank you very much, Ricky. I, I'm definitely left with the sense that we actually as a newsroom and us as individuals could advocate, I think, much more clearly for that last point, which is the accountable use of state money um, and be much stronger on the idea that actually to decriminalize, to educate and to treat addiction as if it has the prior causes that it almost always has, trauma um, and abuse would be less expensive, more humane, and lead to, to better outcomes. So I think we need to go away and think about what Tortoise says and uh, whether we need to keep pushing for this debate to, to reach more areas. We do obviously um, conduct think-ins around the country, not just here in London, and it might be a good subject for one of those. Um, thank you so much, Ricky, Naomi, Graham, Neil and also Norman can't hear me, but thanks to him. Thank you to everybody in the room who's joined in. I hope everybody's learned something. I certainly have. Um, and we hope to, to see you next time.